The two link planar arm is useful as an example robot because it's just complex enough to raise some important questions about kinematics and dynamics. We'll first consider the forward kinematics, which aims to compute the position of the end of the robot given the joint angles. This discussion will include some algebra, but also some general concepts. For us, the general concepts are probably more important than the specific math, but I'm going to include it for completeness. Let's start with the diagram. A lot of good analysis starts with having the right diagram. First, let's just consider... Sorry, there you go. Uh, a two-link arm just in a reference pose. We'll assign some default world coordinates at the first joint, just for clarity, that's the origin. And let's just sort of redraw this now to think about how we might label it. So if I start with the base joint at the origin here, I have some link, there's a joint, and there's another link. So a good way to label this would be to say that the there's a, a, a base angle with respect to the x-axis of the world. We'll call that theta 1. And then the second elbow angle is the angle of the second link with respect to the sort of straight line of the first link. We'll call that theta 2. The links have lengths. We're going to use L1 to designate the first length and L2 to designate the second length. So the general question here is, given theta 1 and theta 2, what is the position of this vector p, which is the end of the robot? It's just a point at the end of this, so there's only two numbers associated with that. So let's first consider the elbow. We're going to look at kind of the elbow joint right here. And we can almost just write it down based upon uh, trig identities. If we have, in this coordinate system with this reference pose, the elbow is a two-vector, which is L1 times the sine of theta 1, and L2, I'm sorry, L1 again, times the cosine of theta, theta 1. And this comes from the definition of a circle and, and sine and cosine as the relationship between the radius of that circle and the, well, for the right triangle, it's the long and the, the two legs of the right triangle formed by that, that first link. The second um, joint uh, can then influence not the elbow position, but the, uh, the end effector position. So we're just going to assume now that we have this elbow vector. We're going to just call it elbow as a vector, and then kind of use that in the algebra. So if I think about the second link here, it's a vector that goes from the elbow to p. And so we can assume that we have elbow. So then uh, p at the, at the end is just going to be the elbow position plus an additional vector. And the result is very similar to the first link. We have a triangle that's formed, and now it's mostly a question of choosing the right angles. In this case, we're going to take L2 times the uh, sine of theta 1 plus theta 2. And the second component is L2 times the cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2. And this is just reflecting the fact that if I draw an additional line in here, I can form a right triangle that right triangle has, uh, has as, as its angle has theta 1 plus theta 2. That's the sum of the two angles that form the angle. And we also know L2. And then from, from there, the derivation is much the same as for the first one. It comes down to the, the definition of sine and cosine. And we get that second vector that goes from the elbow to the end effector. So I'm not going to write out the full longhand version of this, but you see that there's two vectors that are added here to get the end effector uh, end position. Let's consider for a second now what the workspace of this robot looks like. And I'll sort of break the ice and just say it's an annulus. We think about the, the idea that the joints can have full travel, they can go all the way around. Then we can place the origin of the robot at the center here. And if the robot arm is fully straight, right, so the one link comes out and then another link comes out, we're going to get a, the, the maximum position that the, that the arm can achieve is going to be a circle that goes around the origin. If, if the elbow were fully bent, we would have a position that looks something like coming out along L1, and then reversing along L2. And then depending upon the relative ratio of the links, it might span the circle, but it might leave a hole in the middle. You might get an annulus. If L2 is a little shorter, it'll never reach back to the origin. But then it would reach anywhere inside this annual region. So that sort of suggests the workspace. But another property here is, um, looking forward to the inverse problem, is this sort of uh, parallelogram problem. If we have... Uh, a non-fully extended pose, a non-singular pose here, uh, with the with the two with the elbow and the base joints. Consider sort of the parallelogram of the opposite angle 
it's pretty clear that there's going to often be two solutions to reach some pose with a kind of sign difference in, in the elbow angle. And this will be a general property. There's often, uh, the forward kinematics might have a unique solution where given some, for a, for a serial chain manipulator, which is a type of class of manipulators, um, for any given joint angles, you can just like physically configure it and see where the end is. It's going to have a mathematically precise single pose that is where the end vector is given those joint angles. But the inverse problem may be, may be, uh, re may have multiple solutions. And if you're outside the annulus, we'll have no solutions or inside the annulus. So these already gets to the point of like for forward kinematics for a serial chain, there are, uh, is a unique mapping from the, uh, I'm sorry, not a unique mapping, but there's a clear mapping from the joint angles to the end effector pose, but not necessarily a clear inverse mapping. It turns out for parallel mechanisms, it has the opposite properties, but we're not going to get into that. So now let's go back and sort of reconsider now what the inverse problem looks like of how we might formally calculate the joint angles from a desired target position of the end. And once again, it's going to come down largely to drawing really like a good diagram to start. So let's consider now, again, the two-link arm with the same reference pose. And uh, I'm going to consider my kind of joint, ac my world axes here. So we have some uh, first link that comes out along L1, or I'm sorry, of length L1. It has a joint angle, again, of theta 1. We have a second link, which comes out for distance L2. It has its own joint angle, which we're going to just continue the same convention of labeling it relative as theta 2. That defines some end pose here. And then we can sort of visualize now that there's a kind of hypotenuse to this triangle. Um, and we're going to say that that has this unknown length r. Um, and then we're going to label a couple of extra angles, because there's other angles in here that we might we will find useful. We're going to label the, the supplement to theta 2, this inner angle here, we're going to label that beta. And we're going to label this other angle in here, we're going to label that alpha. So now we can start to see, let's say that now for convenience that we are given the end effector position in polar coordinates, um, just to spare us the translation from some Cartesian system. So then we might think that the end here, the end point pose, um, is defined by a position and a distance and an angle. So we'll label that as well. So we're going to say that there is some angle theta. And so the end here is defined by the combination of r and theta in polar coordinates. So some rotation around the origin plus some distance out. So now we can start to label more individual quantities in this expression here. Um, first, let's just sort of make some observations with the geometry. Uh, the total uh, angle here, theta, it's theta 1 plus alpha. That just comes from the sort of definition of the, of the two angles subtending the, the uh, theta. Uh, we can also look at the definition of a supplement that, you know, theta 2 and beta together are always going to be pi radians or 180 degrees. They're supplemental angles. So uh, beta equals pi minus theta 2. And these are just geome geometric relationships. We can also use a couple of trigonometric rules, the law of cosines and law of sines, to make other observations here. So the law of cosines in this case is going to say that r squared equals l1 squared plus l2 squared minus l1 l2 times the cosine of beta. And this is just a trigonometric identity that, and all basically all those all those sides are effectively labeled here. It just reads straight off the identity. There's also another identity, the law of cosines. Uh, if we apply that here, we're going to get r over sine of beta equals L2 over the sine of alpha. That's the second identity. It just comes straight off the identity, given that all the sides and angles are, are labeled as they are. So now we can start to do a little algebra. And the rest at this point is, uh, for a bit, just algebra. Um, if I take the law of cosines expression, I can solve it for beta. And it's really just rearranging the terms. I can say that uh, uh, the cosine of beta equals, and here I'm going to just 
uh, move some terms to the other side, I'm going to get r squared minus l1 squared minus l2 squared. Did I leave out 2? I left out a 2, I'm sorry. Minus 2 l1 l2. And then I can solve for beta by applying uh, some inverse function of cosine, uh, which will, in, in programming, it's usually the a cos function. Uh, here we write it mathematically as cos to the minus 1. So we do get an expression for beta then, um, which is just rewriting this. Beta equals cosine of minus 1, which is a cos uh, of that uh, r squared minus l1 squared minus l2 squared all over minus 2 l1 l2. So that is uh, a little messy, but it is computable um, given explicit lengths of on uh, L1 and L2 and the radial position of that point, um, then this can simply be, can be solved as a numerical function. So we're just going to assume now that we know beta. And then from there, we can not have to write that expression out again and, and go a little further. We'll stop one moment here and say cosine of minus 1 can have 0, 1, or 2 solutions. It is, as a prize, an inverse function uh, it can have a, that's just a property of the function, and then it directly relates to what we observed before about the fact that there can be multiple solutions or no solutions for the two-link arm. A really proper solution now would consider the sort of parallel paths that those will take, but we're just going to sort of simply stick with some positive solution and only find one answer for the moment. So let's go back to the law of cosine. I'm mean, sorry, the law of sines. We had um, the, in the section expression here uh, expressions involving alpha, beta, and sine. So let's rewrite that a little bit. What we can see is that sine of uh, alpha equals, um, I'm just rewriting this line here, sine of alpha equals uh, L2 sine beta divided by R. And again, then we can apply an, an arc cosine or a cosine inverse function to find uh, uh, alpha as a function of uh, those same terms. Remember, beta is something that we previously computed here, so we're just going to consider it to be a known quantity now. And then, and then to wrap up, it's mostly a matter of just using the original geometric observations about the relationship of the angles to say that once you know alpha and beta, then you can almost read off the other angles. Uh, theta 1 equals uh, theta, that sort of target angle, minus alpha, and theta 2 uh, equals um, pi minus beta. And this is ignoring some complexities about multiple values. So, oh, once again, I made the mistake. There you go. Last line is now visible. So, the details of the algebra aren't the, quite the important point here. The mostly the point is to say the forward solution and the geometric and the inverse solution both depend upon kind of the sort of geometric analysis of the serial angles of the serial chain. And in general, the forward chain for this for serial chain uh, structures, the four kinematics are going to have well-defined solutions. Um, it's sort of a property of the physical structure. And then the inverse is going to have uh, more more complexity because it might have no solution. Clearly, if you're outside the workspace, there's no solution, and it might have multiple solutions. And this holds true in higher dimensions. A typical six-axis robot can have, for some workspace configurations, quite a few different. Com, com, you know, configurations of, you know, the elbow positive versus elbow negative, different kinds of angles that all produce the same final pose. And as moving from pose to pose, that becomes very important. Uh, for here, the, the, the key is when you actually get to the, the, the singular configuration where it's straight, and suddenly there's only one solution where the elbow is, is, is very straight, theta 2 is dropped to 0. At that point, it can toggle through to have either positive or negative theta 2. And if you're doing a lot of movement, that's something to consider because that has you know, effects on what, you, what kind of poses you're going to achieve going forward past that point. Let's sort of back up for a second, a second another step and say, uh, in, in practice, uh, this is a lot of algebra, and we're not going to ask you to repeat it. Um, what we're going to say is that oftentimes when we're actually doing these things, what we really do is use code. So in, on the website for the, uh, for the course, uh, there is uh, a page of sample code, and in the, in the lecture sample code are a couple of, a couple of things to look at. One is uh, the two-link IK script, which is, it just basically shows this forward and inverse commandics uh, written in Python using NumPy as a computational process. And what you'll find is that the, the Python very narrowly, very closely matches what I just wrote, although in this particular code it has a slightly different uh, reference pose. 
And so there's some subtle sign changes in the outcomes. And the inverse kinematics ends up looking kind of similar. There's a, there's In this particular code, it does actually consider multiple solutions, and so it actually always returns two solutions. They may happen to be equal, uh, and then there's some numerical problems that occur when you get outside the workspace. But it does sort of show you that there's always going to be, almost always in most parts of the workspace, it's going to be two solutions for a feasible position. Really, truly the last thing to say is that on complex robots, this algebra can get really insanely complicated. And in general, these days, for complex robots, the inverse kinematics calculations, at least the first cut of them, are usually done automatically. So the second example on the, on the lecture notes here, 2 link kinematics pi, actually uses symbolic algebra to derive the same equations. SimPy is a Python package for doing symbolic algebra. It doesn't work on numbers, it works on equations and symbols. And so I have an example on the website where uh, the same derivation that I just performed is performed symbolically in Python to generate equations. And if we scrolled all the way down to the bottom of the page, it shows some sample output. And the expressions, when really written out longhand, as opposed to a sort of computational flow, end up being quite substantial. There are many, 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 many terms in the full closed form expression for the inverse kinematics. Um, it's just this is the way that geometry works. That's what it ends up looking like. So just to say, there's a lot of a lot of complexity in that calculation. Although the sort of more computational process that I use in the, in the numerical example um, is a little bit more legible. So that was a kind of quick introduction to some core concepts for forward and inverse kinematics for serial chains. Uh, the two link is the kind of simplest example of a serial chain. Um, forward kinematics, you know, computing end positions from joint angles, inverse kinematics computing desired joint angles from endpoint positions. And this is all purely a geometric kinematic process, which does, has nothing specific to do with the, with the dynamics.